Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features Jim Lee's Wildcats number no. 9, cover dated March 1994. No cover caption here, but the main villain of the issue, Entropy, features front and center, surrounded by some of the Wildcats there. The most um, interesting feature of this cover is the decision to leave the background white which really helps the image to pop because otherwise it might be a little bit confusing. Also this particular image by Jim Lee and Scott Williams reminds me a little bit of the cover to issue number two. Some of the poses there on the characters are similar. So let's open this one up to the first page. It's almost a full splash page, but not quite where we pick up from the end of the previous issue with the Wildcats flying from New York to the Caribbean, specifically to the Bermuda Triangle, where uh, Jacob Marlowe, uh, Voodoo and Spartan disappeared along with a cruise ship carrying 2000 passengers and staff. And bear that fact in mind when we come to the conclusion of the issue. Now the creative team for the main story, there's an A story and a B story is Brandon Joy and Jim Lee on the credited with the story, Jim Lee pencils, inks, Scott Williams, just Scott Williams on inks, letters by Richard Starkins and Comic Craft. And then the B story, The Bonds of Blood and Steel, the stories by Jeff Marriott and the pencils are by Travis Charest. And there is a bevy of inkers there, Alex Garner, Ray McCarthy, Mark McKenna, Trevor Scott and Al Vey with letters by Bill Oakley. Colors on everything by Joe Chiodo with his uh, color separation team and quite a big team that is too. So let's get back to the A story. There's 25 pages of this A story. So you're getting value for money with this particular issue and the B story is nine pages. So um, good value from Jim Lee to his readers at the time. What I really like about this anchor image here is the rendering of the surface of the Caribbean Sea there. I really like the way he's done that um, in this particular uh, panel here. I think it's very effective. And so we've got the team here coming from New York, as I said, to look for Marlowe, um, Spartan and Voodoo. And then we turn the page to a double page spread. And that is a pretty action packed image there. So we've got Spartan and Voodoo in their costumes, Voodoo in their new costume. And they're being attacked by Daemonites here. So um, uh, Spartan asks Voodoo whether she can use her uh, psionic uh, power to control the Daemonites. And she says here, and it's kind of interesting, she says, can't concentrate, Hadrian. Just too afraid, can't focus, I'm sorry, but I'm only human. So he says, it's all right, he'll find a way out of there. And it kind of rings a little bit of a, what would we say, not quite an alarm bell, but it's a little bit strange for Voodoo, who has, over the course of previous issues, learned to act in combat situations um, to be of this particular um, opinion. And then what happens is what has been happening in almost every single issue since the beginning. Um, Spartan gets ripped to pieces, um, his synthetic body pulled apart by these uh, superpowered daemonites, which takes him by surprise. Voodoo's backing up against the wall there. He tells her to run, get out of here before it's too late. And um, she's attacked by the daemonites. And then we have this sequence of panels here. It's pretty cool as um, Spartan is um, screaming no and it turns out it was all a hallucination wrought by the major enemy of this issue and that is Entropy here. So we got a big villain speech from him about how Hadrian was merely an example for the others, mechanoid, a demonstration of his abilities. And so what are his, are his abilities? Well, he says here, I wield the power to alter the very fabric of reality. And in your case, Spartan, to manipulate the certainties of your infallible computer technology. A neurotronic brain crashing is not a pleasant experience, even for an observer. Now that's a little bit odd there. How does he know that Spartan has a neurotronic brain? But in any case, um, really his main um, aim here is to get revenge on Jacob Marlowe, Lord Emp, and the uh, mystery for Marlowe is who this guy is. So he says, listen up, buddy. I don't know who you are or what you want, but if your grudge is with me, then leave them out of it. So Entropy there thinks he's mocking him, but um, Emp is serious. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I really have no idea what you're talking about. So Q, um, Entropy's sub story and the reason why he is 
um, at Payne's to get revenge on um, Emp. And this is a pretty cool three-quarter profile of um, Entropy and his scarred face. And of course, we're gonna learn what's the cause of the scarring. And then we have a sense that on the other side of his face, it's uh, altogether much worse. And so he's covered it up with this metallic mask. And this is interesting. So the story goes all the way back um, a thousand years earlier. And he says here, we were comrades in arms then, noble cherubim knights on a mission, <clears throat> on a mission to rid the world of the evils that tore it asunder, evils that took many forms. And so here we have an image of um, some guy shouting out power, at last mine is the power to rule this land, to crush, its, to crush it beneath my heel, for with this mystic sword, none can stand against Brannock the Dark. So we've entered into a kind of like a sword and sorcery fantasy world uh, version of the Middle Ages. And it's interesting because I don't think to this point we've ever seen Jim Lee draw anything in the medieval setting. And um, to be fair, to, to be honest rather, he doesn't really take great advantage of that. But I do like um, some of the details of his rendering of this medieval environment. And that includes the rendering of the chain mail here. Um, around this guy's head and also this castle in um, in shadow on the hill with the pennant flying I like that and then we just have this suggestion of um, an army of knights who are uh, starting a siege on the particular castle so this guy Brannock the Dark um, you know I was thinking about this too it's almost like a recall of the opening of Excalibur John Borman's Excalibur the 1981 movie and I wonder did Brandon Choi and Jim Lee have that film in mind here and it's like the mystic sword is Excalibur and this guy's like Uther Pendragon um, uh, at the beginning of that film so anyway he's off boasting that um, he is going to deal with uh, this woman Gwyneth's husband and the uh, and uh, and well her husband is the high and mighty Lord Entropy he says so he's going to um, kill him is what his boast is so then we turn the page and it turns out that Entropy and Emp are uh, uh, attacking the castle and uh, they make their way into the room in which uh, this guy Brannock has uh, Entropy's wife um, manacled to the wall. So he gets ready to attack him here uh, with this mace and he smacks him right in the side of the head. That looks pretty violent and brutal. And then this is a pretty cool image here, kind of top down shot of Entropy coming up towards his wife to free her. And I like the way that Jim Lee has used uh, the pavement floor and the wall itself behind Gwyneth as his panel borders. And then we come back to the present and Entropy asks, um, do you remember now murderer, the betrayal at my moment of triumph that stripped me of everything that I held dear in this world? So Emp doesn't know. He says, interesting story, but it doesn't ring a bell. So uh, Entropy decides to um, use his power to make Emp remember. Now this image here, look at uh, Marlow here, he looks like he's been really working out in the gym or using um, uh, protein supplements or maybe a few steroids to really pump up there. Um, looks a bit different physically from how he did in the very opening issues of the series. Um, but in any case, I like the use of the uh, white uh, negative space here with the panel layouts on this page, that's pretty good. So then Entropy uses that power from this orb-like thing inset in his uh, plate armor to make Emp remember. But our scene switches to New York City, Halo he uh, Corporate Headquarters. I like that establishing shot there of Halo Headquarters. And then we've got a nice top-down image on Void here with, the, uh, with uh, Jacob's butler. And this guy's name is Stansfield. And I talked about in the previous video how I kind of felt he was like a version of Alfred Pennyworth. But actually, I've changed my mind about that. I think he's more like Jarvis uh, from the Avengers comics. Uh, because Alfred, you know, like has a bit of an, um, a wit and, um, you know, goes in for a little bit of irony and sarcasm at um, Bruce's expense. Whereas uh, this guy's altogether more passive and servile which is a little bit more like Jarvis um, in the Avengers. Anyway his name is Stansfield and he's here in order for Void to talk about um, the orb and so she says here 
uh, that the uh, in, she says it is most likely the same entity who first used the power of the orb to attack Lord Emp and the others aboard the Caribbean Princess. So she's got a bead on this um, entity and power. That is entropy. And she says, I must try to locate the origin of this power distortion. And um, uh, Stansfield asks that she won't be exposing herself to more um, uh, aftershocks. And she says, no, the first distortion caught me unaware. This time I'll be prepared and without my aid, the Wildcats will surely fail in their mission to rescue our comrades. So they're already en route, as we saw on the first page to uh, the, uh, the Bermuda Triangle. And then Stansfield asks, is it prudent to go in your weakened state, Miss Tereshkova? I would have to advise against such a course of action. And she says, you are not the leader of this team, Stansfield, and it's not your decision to make it, it is my own. And so she teleports out of there. Like I said, <clears throat> Stansfield just isn't really an Alfred Pennyworth type at all. As I said, he's more like Jarvis. So then we're back with uh, the Merv ship uh, cruising above the Caribbean and they're running out of fuel and they haven't found any trace of the missing, um, uh, the missing, um, what's it called, cruise ship. And then Void beams aboard and she's got news that uh, she has um, some, uh, she has a, uh, like a not a conjecture but she's inferred that what has caused all of this is an orb of power which was the thing that were that they were all looking for um, in the first four issues of the series so we're back to the orbs of power and we're going to get an explanation both of void who and what she is as well as the, as well as well as that first orb, orb of power and its origins so she explains here that she's an, an incarnation of one such orb like this shot here of, of her face and the um, hatching lines uh, by Scott Williams and the, the combination of the colors as well, it looks really good. Now this though is a really remarkable anchor image here. And just look at the uh, inking, um, uh, um, rendering the shiny surface of Void's um, bodysuit here. It's different from Scott Williams' regular style. It does seem to be Scott Williams nonetheless that's doing the inky, but he's trying something else out here. And I was thinking about who does it remind me of? And it reminds me of Mobius, of all people, um, the French um, cartoonist. And it looks just really good. It looks, it's more interesting and more effective than the usual style of rendering Void's uh, metallic uh, bodysuit. So anyway, she goes into the origin story of the orbs and it's worth paying attention to this because it does answer some questions that were raised in previous issues. So she says here, in the future, a great war was fought between the forces of good and evil. Isn't it always the case? In the final battle, the champion of light, Omnia, was defeated and her life force was shattered with shards of her essence scattered throughout the space-time continuum. Over the millennia, many of them have reappeared on Earth in the form of shooting stars. So we see that here with the dinosaurs. Um, upon impact, the shards often took the form of a glowing stone, an orb, with each one possessing a unique aspect of the disembodied whole. Throughout the course of history, a number of these powerful orbs were discovered, and while some humans utilized them for good, we see that here maybe with this priestess um, in a kind of a stone henge type Neolithic structure, others used the orbs for evil. And look at this, ouch, a person of color who's using it for evil bad Jim Lee from the perspective of 2023, eh? In the summer of 1980, one shard struck the Soviet Mir space station, Postota. The spacecraft exploded upon impact while I should have died all along with my, along with my fellow cosmonauts on that day. I was spared when the essence of the orb bonded with my human entity, Major Adriana Tereshkova. So we're getting a proper origin story here for um, Void, finally. And uh, Warblade asked the question, I don't see how your bonding with the orb is going to help us find the others. But she says, well, she's got a connection. They have unique energy signatures. So that is precisely how they're going to find the others. And it turns out that even though they were sweeping uh, the, the sea for signs of the missing ship, it was above them all along. So they fly up to this strange floating structure above them that's shielded from radar. They land uh, with their own cloaking device and they enter the structure and they find the crew and passengers of the cruise ships, two cruise ships disappeared 
that were uh, owned and run by uh, Marlowe's Halo Industries. And Maul sees uh, the, the poor passengers and, and crew um, uh, kind of stuck in the, in the wall. He says here, it looks like we got here just in time. Another couple of hours that have been completely covered with these crystals growing over them. At least this means we're on the right track. So, is there going to be an opportunity to rescue the passengers and crew from the two cruise ships? Well, first of all, back to EMP and Entropy. And um, we have EMP now has his memories restored. Um, so he's he, he has to this point only memories from 1990, but now he's got his full range of memories restored to him. And he believes he's got the full story regarding what happened between him and Entropy a thousand years earlier. By the way, this anchor image here of um, Marlowe looks good, but it also looks like a halfway house between Wolverine and Magneto. And again, it just made me at the time uh, want to see Jim Lee back on the X-Men, but alas, that wasn't to be. So he remembers what happened that a Daemonite um, had, been, uh, had been possessing uh, Brannock and it left his dead body and entered into Entropy's wife's body. So we see her changed here. And I like the use of uh, silhouetting on her face and arm to indicate that change. And she takes up the mystic sword of power, which has that orb inset into it, into the pommel. And uh, this takes Entropy by surprise. And um, Emp basically decides that he's going to have to uh, take action because Entropy isn't going to uh, act against his wife. And here in these two panels, you see Emp swing his sword and behead her. So that's pretty graphic in um, this particular panel. Very effective. And again, Jim Lee with characters uh, fully silhouetted out here in the foreground. Entropy's shocked, asking Emp, what's he, what has he done? Um, Emp says it was because he was left no choice. So in the present, Entropy realizes uh, like remembers briefly what happened before he represses it again and says lies you're trying to trick me with your lies you took her life emp and now I shall have yours feel the true measure of my power and wrath but he's attacked from behind by none other than void and the wildcats have arrived so this anchor image it's okay it's a bit kind of straight on the angle I kind of get the sense that at this point, Jim Lee is maybe uh, looking to get done telling this particular story. Um, if he had more time, maybe he might've come up with a more um, interesting angle um, on this particular uh, scene. So um, Entropy, of course, is going to fight back again. I really like this open border panel of him hunkering down and using the uh, orb of power to blast at uh, Void. This is another nice open border panel here with Maul and Zealot moving in on Entropy to attack him. But he easily um, parries their attack. Then Warblade attacks him from behind and he uses his power against Warblade to send Warblade stretching to the outer limits and beyond the point of no return. So Warblade's out of action and then uh, Voodoo takes Entropy on from behind using her psionic powers to wipe out his mind, but it's not enough. He uh, punches her away. Another open panel on the bottom of the page. So Jim Lee really enjoying this particular, um, uh, what would you say, uh, panel design uh, uh, device. And I like it too. But note here that Voodoo looks more like Entropy's wife from the medieval episode and indeed that's the form that she's taken on and so um, it catches him by surprise he thinks it's her come back to life and that allows um, Emp and Void working together to blast Entropy from behind he says here you see Entropy the power has always been within me I just wasn't able to tap into it before with Void's help though I can channel my internal energies and use them to devastating effect so he's blasting away at Entropy this is a great anchor image here the uh, structure that they're in, that is Entropy's base, starts to crumble. Um, all the masonry, the crystalline masonry falls on top of Entropy. That would appear to be the end of him. And so the Wildcats decide to exit. So they make their way to the ship 
and Jules is waiting there on the ramp. And she's managed, she's asked there by, uh, she's asked by um, Jules, did you find the other passengers? And she says, I only managed to free 20 of them. No, sorry, Spartan asks, and that's significant. I only managed to free 20 of them, Spartan. The rest were too deeply embedded within the crystalline walls. And the whole place started shaking when I got the first ones out. So Zealot flies them out of the structure just as it explodes behind them. And that's the adventure over. And Marlow says, listen up people, you all did a great job, especially the way you stuck together as a team. I'm proud of each and every one of you. Anyway, I've had enough of this Caribbean vacation. It's time to go home. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Jacob. There's 4,000 crew and passengers dead. They've died. And the second 2,000 are your fault because you went aboard a Caribbean, one of your cruise ships, after one of them disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle, and you allowed that ship with its 2,000 crew and passengers to go into the same position that the previous one was lost in order to uh, find out what happened. Instead of doing it without putting at risk, potentially, the lives of 2,000 people. And like, is he broken up about it? You know, like, is he remorseful about all of that? Jacob Marlowe's Fifth Avenue penthouse apartment later that day. And Void asks him, what's wrong, Jacob? You seem troubled. So is he troubled about those 4,000 dead people? This is what he says. I guess after facing entropy, I've come to realize there's still so much I don't know about myself, about my past. It never really bothered me until now. So he's just self-absorbed about himself. I'm beginning to wonder if I'm doing the right thing with my life. Halo or the Wildcats for that matter. I'm just thinking I need to take some time away from it all and figure out what to do with myself. So Void says, as is her want, it is your destiny, Jacob. As I've told you before, you are mankind's greatest champion. And he says, how can you be so sure about that, Adrian? Uh, Adriana, I mean, Entropy was a Lord Caravan, just like me, and look at the way he turned out. Am I really that different from him? No, you're not, because you don't care about 4,000 dead people. And so Void says to him, the two of you had nothing in common. And here we go. This is the big kind of emotional payoff. He says, that's where you're wrong, Adriana. Entropy's my brother. Do you have any idea how that makes me feel? No, I've made my decision from tomorrow. You and Spartan will lead the Wildcats. I'm out. Now, great art on this page, but really, as I said, um, uh, Marlow, uh, mankind's greatest champion. I don't think so. 4,000 crew and passengers dead. What about them? Like, where is the consequences for him and for Halo Industries for that absolute disaster? And really, Brandon Choi and Jim Lee aren't properly dealing with a question that any reader might have. And that's not the kind of thing you would see go unnoticed in an issue of the X-Men at the time. There's no way that Chris Claremont would overlook something like 4,000 dead people or any of the writers who came after like Fabian Nicieza or Scott Lobdell. You simply can't sweep that under the carpet like Choi and Lee have done here. Um, anyway, there's a backup story which is much better, um, uh, written by Jeff Marriott and uh, penciled by Travis Charret with that bevy of different inkers. And it focuses in on Warblade. So this is a nine page backup story. And Warblade in his free, in his free time um, is hunting daemonites and he's got a lead on this guy called Dexter um, who has been working for um, a crime boss possessed by a daemonite and so he busts into his apartment and in the apartment he fi finds this infant um, in his cot with his teddy bear and he's saying where, where is he kid did your dad take off and leave you all alone guess I've got some time to kill you want to wait together me I was an orphan your dad may be a low-life loser dirtbag, but at least you've got one, he says, as he plays with the uh, the child. And so we're learning a little bit something about Warblade here, um, Reno Bryce, and that's good because we learn absolutely hardly anything about him in the first four issues of uh, the series. And then he hears something at the door, a key in the uh, door, and it turns out to be Dexter, the guy he's waiting for. And look at the visuals, uh, the way that uh, Travis Charest has rendered this guy. My uh, conjecture is he's modeling Dexter on Michael Bean. Michael Bean, uh, circa um, The Abyss, circa James Cameron's The Abyss. So of course, Michael Bean 
was in the first Terminator movie and he was in um, also Aliens and then The Abyss. So working with James Cameron on his 1980s movies. And this guy here looks very much like Michael Bean, circa The Abyss, with kind of like the, um, the high hairline. Uh, of Michael Bean in that era. So pretty cool anchor image here of Warblade with his hands, his arms crossed, uh, waiting for uh, Dexter, and he's about to pull his uh, gun here, which he does. Nice layout on this page. This is very much a uh, characteristic Travis Charest page layout with the silhouetted figures here, and um, Warblade's ponytail acting as a panel border. That's pretty cool. And also the back of Dexter's coat acting as a panel too. That's inventive, that's really nice um, on Charest's part. And it shows that he's thinking uh, in terms of uh, storytelling and also the aesthetics of the panel layouts as well. And he's getting creative with it and moving beyond anything like just a Jim Lee influence. That's the most Michael Bean looking um, image of Dexter, I think. Let me know in the comments what you think about my uh, guess on that one. So they fight and Dexter turns out to be stronger than Warblade was expecting. Um, he pulls that gun on Warblade again as Warblade is on the ground. Warblade uses his claws to pull out the floor from beneath Dexter who falls out the window and he blasts with his gun as he's falling out. Some nice storytelling on these pages. And he hits the ground, breaks a leg. And this is a great anchor image of Warblade um, leaping out uh, the, the window too, onto the ground. He's getting ready, ready to uh, gut, or not gut, actually, looks like he's getting ready to cut his throat here. Says to him, this will only hurt for the rest of your life, but that'll be short, huh? And then he looks up and he sees the child with his teddy bear looking out the window, watching and crying. And that catches Warblade. He's, he, uh, in his first person narration, he says, it's the kid, nuts. I can, I can't, can I do this in front of him without being just as bad as the Daemonites? Maybe I can contain the Daemonite without hurting Dexter. And I like the narrowing of the panels here and the focus in on the eyes. Damn these frail human forms, Dexter says. He goes for the gun and he blasts away at... Warblade who uh, dodges um, the bullets, but they their trajectory is such that they go through the open window and have they hit the child? So Warblade thinks maybe they have. If you've hurt that kid, Dexter, well, never mind. He's good at him. He's truly good at him now. So he's down, he's dead. Great anchor image here. Uh, great uh, spotting of blacks on this image of Warblade. He looks really cool in this. Maybe cooler than anything that Jim Lee has done with him to this point. So he says, you didn't leave me any choice, Dexter. I feel bad about that. At least there's nothing I can do that'll make me hate myself as much as I do Daemonites. But is the child dead? Well, let's turn to the last page, page nine. And it turns out not. So we're here in Halo's uh, legal department and Warblade is leaving the child with this um, lawyer, Sandra Wilson and he's um, asking her to make sure that the kid gets a home, a, a good home with a real family. And he's got the uh, case, the suitcase of money as well. Uh, there's some money here, it should help take care of any expenses that might come up, he says. And then the child pops him one in the jaw. You're a good little guy, he says, I think I'm going to miss Hey, So he pops him in the jaw and Warblade here smiles in the final panel, a fast learner too. Maybe he'll find a better teacher someday. At least now he's got a fighting chance. A fighting chance for what? To get revenge, as far as that child uh, understands, you've killed his father. He doesn't understand that the father was a daemonite or anything like that. So this is potentially setting up um, a revenge scenario in the future where this child is gonna come for Warblade. That would be pretty interesting to follow up on that potential storyline. So I do like this backup story, I think it's clever and uh, just much more interesting. And there more, there, there's just more depth of characterization and implication in this backup story than there is in the main story, for sure. Let us page here. And there you go, advertisement for the upcoming, um, it's advertising it as three upcoming issues with Chris Claremont, but actually Claremont did four issues after this um, on the title. 
So there you go. I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Wildcats number nine. If you did, please like the video on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.